Hey guys, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study on the Rapture and the Endurance of the Saints. So in this session, we're going to uh, essentially repeat what we did last week, uh, except this time we're going to do so with regard to the post-tribulational rapture. We're going to look at some of its strengths and then look at some of its weaknesses, really uh, its primary weakness. Now, let me just say this before we jump in. This is going to be a short session. Um, this is by no means comprehensive. You know, we could probably work through a lot, of, a lot more strengths, and I'm sure a lot more weaknesses as well. But just for the the sake of simplicity, uh, I'm just going to keep it simple, like we did last week. So let's go ahead and begin with the primary strengths of the uh, post-tribulational view of the rapture. So first of all, like really. Most of the strengths boil down to um, some of the statements in Scripture that seem to place the resurrection, the return of Jesus in the rapture, at the very end of the, uh, the last three and a half years. Really, that's ultimately what it boils down to. And in that sense, I would say probably the first strength, um, actually before I get into the things that I've got listed here, I would say probably the first strength is the simple fact that post-tribulationism is easy to understand. You know, it's very simple. Um, you've got this final seven-year period, this final uh, Shavuah uh, that's spoken of in Daniel 9, but in the middle of that week or that seven-year period, the Antichrist sets up the abomination of desolation, and then it's basically at the end of um, the second three and a half years that Jesus returns, saves the saints, the rapture, the resurrection, it all happens concurrently, it all happens together. Okay, so it's a, it's a relatively simple story when you just sort of look at it from 30,000 feet. Now, once you get into all of the details, you get your hands dirty, you go, what about this passage, what about this, what about this argument? That's where things always become more difficult, okay? But overall, um, the simplicity of the timeline is actually one of its greatest strengths. You know, as they say, uh, brevity is the soul of wit, or, you know, Oakham's razor, like the simplest explanation to something is not only often the correct answer, but it's often most convincing. Um, and I find that in terms of persuasion, uh, it's the simplicity of this that is quite persuasive. Now, conversely, um, with the pre-wrath rapture, it's the simplicity and the very straightforward nature of the cosmic signs and the sixth seal. That tends to be the most convincing. But again, once your hands get dirty, you start getting into all the problems, that's when things become a little bit more difficult. Okay, so let's go ahead um, with the first strength, or the second strength now that we've sort of listed the first one. Um, the Antichrist will be given authority specifically to persecute the saints, for three and a half years. Now, we addressed this in a previous session, but in Daniel 7, verse 25, it says of the Antichrist, he will speak out against the Most High, and he will wear down the saints of the Highest One. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. So it says that the saints of the Highest One will be given into his hand for three and a half years, time, times, and half a time. So if this is talking about Christians, then it says that we will be given into the hand of the Antichrist for three and a half years. Now, the argument against this is to say, well, that here the saints of the Most High, this is, uh, this is not Christians, this is Israel. So now you start getting into sort of like dispensationalism. Well, that's the church, that's Israel, that's Israel, not the church, this type of thing. Um, but if we consistently work through the usage of the term saints, I think very legitimate arguments can be made that it's both. It's both Israel and uh, the church. In fact, it calls them the saints of the Most High. Similarly, uh, I guess the third strength of the post-tribulational view is the very simple fact that repeatedly, multiple times, I didn't list them all here, but I want to say it's like six or seven times. It's quite a few times. It might be, I mean, it might be five, but I think it's like six or seven. Jesus refers to the resurrection, um, and again, the rapture happens 
at the resurrection. They're one and the same. The resurrection is of the dead. The rapture is simply the term used for those who remain and are alive at that time. They're transformed. They're caught up in the air to meet the resurrected saints and Jesus as they come back, as they descend from heaven. But repeatedly, it says that this will happen at the last day. Jesus said that will happen when? At the last day. So, for example, John 6, verse 39. Jesus said, This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but I raise it up on the last day. So it's on the last day. It's not a couple years before the last day. The resurrection, Jesus said, is on the last day. Uh, Again, John 6, verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Again, John 6, 54. And most of these statements, they're kind of right there in uh, John chapter 6. Um, I believe they're almost all there repeatedly. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up. When? On the last day. So, you know, the argument would have to be made that when he says the last day, he didn't really mean the last day. It was just an expression referring to the broad end of the age. And that's possible. It's certainly possible. But again, if we're simply taking his words here at face value, he seems to be saying it's at the last day. And that would be the last day, the day of the Lord, the transition from this age into the age to come, the last day of this age. Okay, that would, that would be the more restrictive, um, restricted use um, of the phrase, although it's possible. And I want to, you know, to those that are um, pre-wrath, they're going to say, well, that's, it's more of an expression. It doesn't actually mean the last day. I would say, okay, um, you know, that's possible. It's like the Bible uses a lot of different forms of expressions. This one I addressed previously, and this one's awfully difficult, um, I think, to get around. But we are all called to endure. When the Bible calls us to endure, it's till the very end of the three and a half years. So in Daniel 12, 11 through 12, it says, From the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, so that's the middle of the, uh, of the Shabuah, the middle of the week, the middle of the seven years, it says, From that point there will be 1,290 days. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days. So here it says that we are blessed if we keep waiting and if we endure or if we attain to that full 1,335 days. Again, very, very clear. The only way really to get around this is to say, well, this is for the Jews. This is for the Jews. And again, it's in Daniel and you can make that argument, but again, um, I think it. I think once we go down that sort of dispensational road and say this is strictly for the Jews and not for the church and this for the church and this type of thing, I think we um, enter really dangerous, confusing ground. Oftentimes there's a close relationship. Yes, there's a degree to which there's a distinction between Israel and the church, but there's also quite a lot of overlap. And um, I think it's dangerous here to say this is not referring to us. Um, It's just referring to unbelieving Israel. You know, why are they waiting if they don't even believe? Um, The post-tribulational rapture also places the rapture, and we've talked about this, at the last trumpet. Okay, Paul the Apostle repeatedly, consistently says that the rapture will happen at the last trump, the last trumpet, the last shofar. And of course, the last trumpet in the book of Revelation would be the seventh trumpet. Okay, so, you know, you can make the argument, well, Paul was unaware of the book of Revelation, so when he said the last trumpet, he didn't actually mean the last trumpet because there's a lot of other trumpets and, you know, this type of thing. Personally, I don't believe God is a God of confusion. He's not the author of confusion. And I understand that the book of Revelation was not written when Paul said that, but I believe there is an intertextuality, a relationship between all of these books that is not, you know, the book of Revelation is not ignorant of Paul's epistles, okay? I believe that when Paul said it's at the last trumpet, a pretty good case. I mean, it's awfully hard to say, yeah, actually, there's at least seven more trumpets after the last trumpet. 
Well, they're different trumpets, and you know, I, again, I, I've heard the various arguments. Um, so, again, as I said, I think there is strength in the fact that the post-tribulational time frame is uh, quite simple. I think that is one of its strengths. I would argue that as excellent as um, you know, men like Alan Kirshner and Zion's Hope uh, are in terms of laying out the pre-wrath timeline, it is much more complicated. I mean, you really, you go, okay, so it's cut short. Well, it's 1,260 days. Yeah, but it's cut short. And, you know, like there's quite a lot there. It does require a lot more explanation. And so in that sense, I think a lot of folks are just going to tend to look at the post-tribulational view and go, yeah, it's it just seems a lot easier, a lot easier to understand. So that is one of its... Um, strength. So now, really, I don't have a big, big list of problems um, with the post-tribulational view, but the one I do have is significant, and it's really big, um, which is very simple. The sixth seal, okay, now this is not only a weakness of the post-tribulational view, it's also a strength of the pre-wrath view, which is that at the sixth seal, you clearly have the cosmic signs, the sun goes dark, the moon turns blood, this type of thing, which elsewhere, for example, in Matthew 24, we clearly see that that is the definitive marker saying that it's after the tribulation and that is the catching up of the saints. So you look at that and it clearly, you would say, okay, we have to place the rapture in between the sixth and the seventh seal. The problem is a natural reading of the text seems to have the trumpets and the bulls following consecutively and after the seals, right? So if that's the case, then you go, okay, the pre-wrath view is, you know, you've got the rapture at the sixth seal, but then you've got all of the trumpets and the bulls. And that really is the biggest weakness, the biggest challenge, the biggest difficulty for the post-tribulational view of the rapture. And the only way to really get around that is to view the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls as somehow overlapping one another. Now, for those who do believe in a post-tribulational uh, rapture of the church, usually when you look at their charts, they have, they, they're not all, like, the first seal is usually not lined up with the first trumpet. But the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, and the seventh bowl always usually end up lining up. You know, they're arranged differently in different people's schemas, but usually, most often, you have the seventh of uh, each of the, the, the judgment series all kind of concluding. Now, again, I have to acknowledge um, that this is a problem. I'm going to quote here. This is um, from Alan Kirshner, who, again, I'll have him on probably in a couple weeks here once I finish everything up because I'm going to do at least one more session, probably two after this, and then we'll have Alan on. And I'll see if there's, uh, you know, possibly another post-tribber that might want to also come on um, just to to round it up. Now, again, I want to be very clear, as I've said multiple times, I don't think that these things are worth arguing about. I really don't. I don't think that arguing between pre-rathers and post-tribbers, it's okay to discuss these things. But not like passionately, like it's a huge pastoral difference. Again, pastorally speaking, from a practical perspective, we want the church to be prepared and ready to face the Antichrist. If we have to endure for three and a half years or two years and nine months or three years, you know, like we're not sure, that's, that is not something to get in, um, you know, sort of big arguments over. I firmly believe that post-tribbers and pre-rathers, we really should unite in trying to prepare the church to be ready to face the Antichrist and the Great Tribulation. We agree that the pre-tribulational rapture of the church is destructive and dangerous. It's dangerous. It's unbiblical. It's it's indefensible. You really cannot defend it from Scripture. Um, Under the light of scrutiny, it falls apart really, really quickly, apart from all the little popular cliches and different things like that. But here's a uh, quote from Alan Kirshner. He says, The trumpets all caps, cannot begin until the seventh seal is opened, according to Revelation 8, verses 1 through 4. And I agree with him. When you read it, the language certainly seems to indicate that. No post-tribber has ever been able to explain this passage in any meaningful 
fashion. Now, let me just say, my friend Alan, he can often word things very, uh, almost polemically, like very strong, and he's very passionate about, um, you know, defending the pre-wrath view, and that's okay. I, you know, I'm the same way. When I'm behind something, I can be very forceful sometimes. I don't think I am at the time, but then when people l go back and they go, yeah, look at that, you know, I'm like, yeah, okay, you know, I was pretty passionate. Um, how would I explain it? I'll probably actually get into this a little bit more um, in the next sessions, but essentially it's the, the, to answer this is to simply say this is the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, and I've said this a million times, it is a really hard book. And it gives us these pictures and these snapshots of things to communicate things that are very important. But I sometimes think that we are um, in error when we look to it to give us these strict timelines, these strict, yeah, timelines. I lean much more towards sticking with a uh, timeline from the book of Daniel and then allow the book of Revelation to sort of um, augment or bring f further clarity to that which the, the Bible has already laid a foundation for. But the book of Revelation, you know, in teaching through it, um, it's got a lot of difficult passages. Um, even, you know, Revelation 19, the return of Jesus there, that's a very difficult passage. Because a lot of people look at it and they think it's like as if John's having an actual vision of the return of Jesus. But the reality is it's more of like a, it's like an icon. And it's filled with symbolism, a sword coming out of his mouth. Well, Jesus, it's not a sword is not literally going to come out of his mouth. He's got King of Kings and Lord of Lords written on his thigh. He doesn't actually have a tattoo on his thigh. It's all these different sort of images and symbols that are communicating the vision, <clears throat> the victorious return of Jesus. Okay. Likewise, in the book of Revelation, when it comes to the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls, it kind of lays something out, but it's very apocalyptic. It's very symbolic. And we need to be very careful. And in some sort of mysterious spiritual way, um, which I don't even claim to have a very clear uh, timeline in terms of laying it out. I've tried. And no matter how you try it, it just doesn't quite work. Again, I would argue that's the same with the pre-wrath view. Um, it's just very challenging. And so we have to say, in some mysterious way, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls are not concurrent. Um, but actually, they, they're not consecutive, I'm sorry. They are concurrent. They sort of overlap a bit. So I'm going to end that right there. Um, as I said, the weakness, the greatest weakness of the post-tribulational view is the fact that the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls seem to, seem to be laid out consecutively. Um, and, and look, that's just the nature of seals, right? Like you have to get to the last seal. The trumpets are within the scroll, so you'd have to finish the seal before you unleash um, the trumpets and the bowls and that sort of thing. So again, as I said, very short uh, session this week. Next week, I'll get into, start parsing through stuff a little bit, sort of just, again, making my arguments. Um, for example, why I believe that the great multitude in Revelation 7, that they're not raptured. They're not saints that have been raptured. Rather, they're martyrs. This is a big point of contention um, between the the pre-wrath and the post-trib position, um, you know, talk about some of the arguments that we've already laid out and why the, I'm not, you know, again, I'm not arguing. I want to be clear. I'm basically saying, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but I just want to be honest and just tell you, and again, tell you how I feel. Go like this argument, well, it'll be cut short. Therefore, we can just ignore all of these other passages which say it'll be this long. I go like, that argument just doesn't work with me. But it doesn't matter what I think. It's not like, well, I, you know, I, I see this so often. Like, I like this teacher. He's my teacher. I agree with him. Don't agree with me. Agree with the Word and the Holy Spirit. What is God saying to you when you study the Word? Be a Berean. Don't rely on me or Alan Kirshner or, you know, anyone. Uh, excellent, excellent teacher. Rely on the Scriptures and the Holy Spirit to guide you. So amen and amen for now. As I said, next week I'll jump back in and we'll get, it'll probably be a little bit more um, kind of exciting next week because we will hash through some of these arguments. So God bless you all. Have a fantastic week. Cling to Jesus with all your heart. These are incredibly dark days, incredibly painful, painful days, but he has promised he will get us through. So amen and amen. God bless and Maranatha.